Good morning, this is Steve Maskin, and I'm sorry I could not be with you today as we are dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. I would like to thank Dr. Hamra for allowing me to submit my slides with audio files to present my talk on introductory my bone and ground probing. I would also like to acknowledge Claire Tolan as my research assistant. My disclosures are on the bottom of the slide and include MGD Innovations and Contina. In my talk, we will be discussing how gland probing targets and releases periductal fibrosis located both distal, just inside the orifice, and proximal, deeper in the lid, which, one, reduces patient symptoms of lid tenderness and symptoms excluding lid tenderness, two, restores gland functionality with increased expressible glands, three, activates gland precursor cells, and four, increases gland tissue on mimography. We will also briefly review the findings and conclusions from the five randomized controlled trials on introductal probing for refractory obstructive MGD. We will also review the probing protocol that I used. This graphic shows the concept of multifocal periductal fibrosis, which is depicted as an orange ring around the gland duct, which can occur both distally to all asini just inside the orifice, as well as proximally to at least one asinus. The obstructed part of the gland sees increased interductal pressure, creating lid tenderness and loss of function with atrophy over time. This slide shows periductal fibrosis using confocal microscopy at the lid margin of patients with obstructive MGD. Figure B shows an organized circumferential belt of periductal fibrosis with internal lumen contracture and overall duct stricture. Figure C shows focal pinching from fibrosis at 4 to 5 o'clock with compromise of basal epithelium and basement membrane, as well as circumferential scalloping of the basement membrane. This slide shows an outcome of the release of periductal fibrosis from gland probing, as we see the liberation of a plug of trapped mybum along the wire probe. This release of fibrosis is accompanied by an audible pop or series of pops called gritty, with a collaboration of introductal pressures at the point of constriction and dramatic and immediate elimination of lid tenderness, often prompting a wow from the patient. This slide shows the two different clinical response curves to probing usual visual analog scales. Early on in the development of gland probing, I noted some patients responded with immediate and dramatic improvement in symptoms, while other patients had some immediate improvement, which gradually further improved over one to three months. It hit me one day as I was walking between exam rooms and the difference in clinical response was due to the patient's symptoms. Lid tenderness relief was immediate and dramatic, and therefore lid tenderness was likely mechanically created and relieved with the mechanical act of probing, while symptoms as burning, stinging, and photophobia took longer to improve. I wondered then what could be occurring at the cellular level to explain the one to three month improvement in gland functionality with decreased symptoms other than lid tenderness. This slide shows the typical increase in expressible glands that we see after probing. In this study, a more than 400% increase in expressible glands was observed at two and a half months in those lids who had pre-probing expressible glands of four or less. Certainly, probing's mechanical release of periductal fibrosis could explain some of the increased numbers of expressible glands, but what might be occurring at the cellular level to further explain these increased numbers as well as improvement in the reduction of symptoms such as burning and photophobia? We have published in the British Journal of Ophthalmology in 2018 the finding of increased gland tissue after probing, and at the World Cornea Congress earlier this week, we showed our data on the significantly increased duct wall thickness and increased epithelial cell layers after probing, suggesting activation of meibomian gland precursor cells. This slide shows pre and post probing confocal microscopy images of the identical gland distal duct in A and B with greater than 30% increase in duct wall thickness at six months. The curve on the right shows the effect of probing on the proliferation of duct wall epithelium with increased wall thickness over the course of one year. We do not show it here, but there was also a significant and concomitant increase in lumen area. Figure C and D shows increased gland tissue after probing as seen on mimography. How about the five randomized controlled trials of gland probing in patients with refractory obstructive meibomian gland dysfunction? We will briefly review key findings and author's conclusions now. First is the Kirkheidal study in 2020, 
who looked at post-treatment results at one month compared to baseline for three groups, probing plus blephamide, probing plus gentile ointment, and sham probing plus gentile ointment. They found statistical significance for improvement in symptoms as measured by SANDI and OSDI for only the groups that received gland probing. The authors concluded probing was safe and no adverse events and that my, my bone gland probing can be an effective procedure to reduce patient symptoms. Second is the Wong et al. study in 2019 who compared intense pulse light series of treatments to my bone gland probing alone to my bone gland probing with subsequent IPL. They found statistically significant improvement in signs and symptoms for all three groups compared to their baseline. When comparing across groups, they found the best results was my bone gland probing with subsequent IPL. The authors concluded IPL, my bone gland probing, and combined my bone gland probing with IPL are all effective methods for refractory obstructive my bone gland dysfunction patients. However, the combination of my bone gland probing and subsequent IPL method could maximize the therapeutic benefits. The third study is in Chekalon et al. in 2019, who compared gland probing plus conventional treatment to the control group of conventional treatment alone. They found a statistically significant faster improvement for both signs and symptoms in the group receiving gland probing when compared to conventional treatment alone. The authors wrote, probing is a simple, reproducible, and safe technique our study plays an important role in revealing the rapid efficacy of probing in addition to conventional treatment versus conventional treatment alone. And hereby, probing may become part of primary treatment as well as being an option in the patients resistant to conventional therapy in the future. The fourth randomized control study is by Ma and Liu in 2016, who compared gland probing plus fluoromethylone topical steroid to the control group of fluoromethylone topical steroid alone. They found statistically significant improvement in signs and symptoms in the group that received gland probing when compared to the control group of topical steroid alone. In the group receiving gland probing, 76% of patients reported relief within the first day after probing and before starting topical steroid. The authors wrote, probing had significant efficacy regarding symptom relief and tear film stabilization. Probing could be a valuable technique in the treatment of refractory obstructive meibomian gland dysfunction. The fifth randomized control study is from Dong Ju et al. in 2014, who compared gland probing to gland probing plus intraductal steroid antibiotic to control group of conventional treatment alone. They found statistically significant improvement in signs and symptoms in each of the two groups receiving probing when compared to the control. The addition of intraductal steroid antibiotic with probing led to further improvement compared to probing alone, but did not reach statistical significance. The authors wrote, probing seems to provide rapid and lasting symptom relief and significant improvement in symptoms and signs of MGD in patients. An introductal meibomian gland probing is a safe, effective technique for MGD. What is my recommended probing protocol? First, I focus on providing a well anesthetized lid, which in many cases can be achieved with topical jojoba anesthetic ointment. But with more chronic inflamed and sensitized lids, it is best achieved with the anesthetic approach used in the aesthetic facial procedures with the addition of a supraorbital and infraorbital nerve block. The important point on this slide of materials used for the nerve block is the use of the JBP nanoneedle 33 gauge and four millimeters long. Once the lids are anesthetized, the probing begins with the shortest and stiffest probe. The one millimeter probe is most likely to find the correct entry angle into the natural orifice. If lid tenderness persists, then move to the two and four millimeter long probes. Consider use of a dilator probe for especially dense periductal fibrosis or in preparation for subsequent intraductal lavage using a large bore microtube. 
Following probing, you may want to gently express out the now liberated mybum remaining within the duct, followed by introductory lavage using a pharmaceutical, such as a corticosteroid solution like dexamethasone, using a small bore microtube, or a longer lasting suspension such as celestone using a large bore microtube. I have used other introductory treatments as autologous blood products as well. After completion of the entire procedure, I remove the bandage contact lens and irrigate copiously, removing any residual anesthetic ointment from the lid margin. This slide composite shows an overview of the probing procedure, including 1A and 1B administering a supraorbital and infraorbital nerve block. 2A shows obtaining the jojoba anesthetic ointment. And in 2B, we show the lids closed after placing the ointment on the lower lid margin anesthetizing both upper and lower lid margins simultaneously. Figure three, I'm probing at the slit lamp with a technician providing gentle support on the back of the patient's head. Figure 4A and 4B shows probing of the upper and lower lids respectively. Figure 5A shows a four millimeter probe safely within the central duct of the mybomi gland, while 5B, 5C, and 6 shows retrieval of a sample of mybum from within the central duct for analysis, avoiding the contamination from surface lipids. Introductal probing my bombing glands is safe and analogous to treating other tissues and organs from the inside. Our ability to safely cannulate and treat the my bombing gland from the inside broadens the range of tissues and organs that are internally cannulated in routine medical practice at the beginning of the 21st century. These include exocrine salivary glands, as well as pancreas and biliary tree, in addition to cerebral, coronary, and renal arteries, plus the urethra and esophagus for treatment of strictures. The mybomi gland is a skin appendage embryologically derived from surface ectoderm. In contrast to the mybomi gland, the urethra and esophagus are embryologically derived from endoderm and have lumens in continuity with vital organs. For urethral and esophageal lumen strictures, the internal approach to dilating the lumen is an effective targeted treatment of mechanical blockage. We have found the same to be true of treating internal strictures of the mybomi glands with introductal probing. Here we can see a series of one millimeter probes entering through the gland orifice into the distal duct. Note the three-dimensional aspect of the mybomi glands as we see the probes surrounded by and partially obscured by acinar ductal units. In this and the next probing example, once inside the duct, I try to dilate the duct with a side-to-side -side and circular motion. The probe remains visible. We now show examples from three lids of a two millimeter probing of a mybomian gland. Note the two millimeter probe reaches further inside the gland. Here is a four millimeter probe safely entering and probing a mybomian gland. After probing open the mybomian glands to restore introductal integrity, we then may introduce a microtube to inject a pharmaceutical or medication. Here are two examples where we are injecting dex dexamethasone. It should be noted that we have yet to see any signs of gland distension with injection.
Here we pass a four millimeter long tube to retrieve a myelin specimen from the mid gland. With higher magnification, we can visualize the microtube sitting inside the duct, extending out through the orifice. From within the duct, the tip gently and benignly nudges an asinus. The myelin specimen is captured inside the microtube as seen here after tube removal from the gland. Summary and conclusions, periductal fibrosis is a major cause of obstructive MGD and may be located distal or proximal. Proximal periductal fibrosis permits an expressible gland and therefore only appears healthy, but is actually diseased. Restoring ductal integrity is an important therapeutic goal for successfully treating obstructive MGD, which leads to decreased symptoms, improved signs, and gland functionality. Pre and post probing observations of confocal microscopy distal duct images suggest reversal of lumen contraction and increased duct wall thickness with epithelial cell proliferation and increased gland tissue on mybography, suggesting stem cell activation. Thank you for your attention.